My name is John Carpenter, um, and I'm going to talk to you today about technologies in glass. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, what's happening in terms of guidelines as well. Uh, in particular, a new guideline that's really getting an awful lot of um, uh, action is called wellness. And we've been talking for years, actually, about wellness in buildings. And so often, talking about how we design a building, and uh, it looks magnificent, but sometimes, uh, in, in some instances, perhaps the people who are occupying the building weren't considered nearly enough. And so we're going to talk about that and how we can actually measure that today. It's actually a new science which is uh, heavily, very quickly evolving. I know several people in here that we've spoken to on recent projects about that, about how it really does affect people within the building. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a few different technologies. I'm going to start off by uh, showing you a couple of videos on one of the newest technologies and I'll, we're going to demonstrate it as well and what it does. So the, the, the key driving force here is how do we make buildings more comfortable? Well, certainly one of the first ones is to make sure that we allow in natural light. We've all been talking about that for years. But natural light, just um, not controlled, is not necessarily good because then we experience things like unwanted solar heat gain, uh, we experience glare, and so the first thing we do is pull down blinds. And really a blind, a closed blind is what? Nothing more than an extension of a solid wall. So how do we, the big challenge now today is how do we actually overcome that and give people connectivity to the exterior, cause them to feel better, to feel more healthful, uh, in things like healthcare, literally heal faster. Well, we've today technologies exist that do that. We have a number of examples we'll show you as well. View dynamic glass is actually the the world's first and really only true intelligent glass. And what it, what it does as a system, as an example, this video will tell you, it actually, the system knows, as an example, the building's location on the planet. It knows the north vector. Thus, it knows how the sun will interface with the building at every moment in time. It knows the day of year, the time of day, the watts of energy striking every elevation. And then based upon that, it actually uses artificial intelligence to change its properties before they need to be changed, i.e., we're in a building. Uh, the sun's striking the building, and we might decide, hey, this is, there's too much glare, we've got too much solar heat gain, pull down the blinds, someone, and down they go. And we often know that they remain closed for days on end. So this system actually knows the weather forecast constantly from half a dozen sources. It know, can measure the watts of energy striking at every elevation, and then based upon that, it will change properties to be ready when the sun strikes that elevation. So this uh, first video is uh, better than I can say in terms of demonstrating that. So. Too much heat is uncomfortable, and glare on our computer screen is frustrating. Here at VIEW, we've developed Intelligent Glass that takes care of this for you. We call it VIEW Dynamic Glass. It's regular glass, but it has five thin layers of metal oxide deposited on it that are only one micron thick. When a tiny electric charge is applied to these layers, it causes the glass to tint electronically. This reduces unwanted heat and glare while keeping you connected to the outside world. The glass can automatically adjust using view intelligence, which means individual windows, zones, or even whole facades respond intuitively to outside conditions, keeping you more comfortable with no effort. It takes multiple factors into account. The building's architectural features, its latitude and longitude, orientation, and exact astronomical data then uses this information to calculate the relative position of the sun at any given moment. Also, a light sensor on the building provides current information about the weather, such as cloud cover, while the system grabs real-time web feeds from multiple weather services, so it can always predict what's to come. Inside the building, the intelligence creates a blueprint of how sunlight affects each area by looking at individual window sizes, placement, employees' desk locations, zoning, and the building's allowable heat load. Our windows can be integrated into building management systems, which means the glass communicates with interior lighting and heating and cooling so everything adjusts in unison to maximize comfort and save energy. And don't worry, if the configuration of the building ever changes, the intelligence can be reprofiled to match. To customize settings, you can always use your mobile device to make adjustments on the fly. Otherwise, it runs automatically, with three main goals in mind. Its first priority is to prevent glare, and it does this by tinting before the sun reaches an angle that would cause a problem. The next priority is heat control, 
based on maximum heat loads calculated during the building design phase. It makes tint adjustments, which reduces the demand on HVAC systems. Once glare and temperature are taken care of, our windows let in as much daylight as possible to support health, happiness, and productivity. It seems complex, but View Intelligence actually makes it simple for you. Help everyone be more comfortable, conserve energy, and save money with View Dynamic Glass, a more intelligent window. So that gives you an overall view of what this technology does. Um, I want to tell you that this has uh, been installed in a number of projects across Canada. The next video is going to talk about Humber River Hospital, where there are a thousand of these units on that building. And it talks about the rationale as to why they decided to go with it. And really what we're talking about is bringing in natural light, making it more healthful for the people inside the building, having absolute control over, the, over it at the same time. hospital is located at the north of Toronto. It's approximately 1.8 million square feet. It's North America's first fully digital hospital. When we looked at the challenges of designing and building this hospital, we first needed to look at what the community needed and what the future of healthcare was going to look like. We not only wanted the digital hospital of 2015, we wanted the digital hospital of 2030. One of the main features of our sustainable design was energy efficiency. And by achieving the benchmarks that we set for ourselves, we believe that we will be the most energy efficient hospital in North America. Actually, very many studies reflect on the effect of daylight for patients and their families in a hospital. There's a lot of literature that will suggest there's great benefits to healing. It actually speeds the healing up. Originally, the project specifications talked about integral blind system. As one solution, we looked at doing roller blinds on the outside. The roller blinds were found to be a concern for infection control for the hospital and collection of dust and dirt. So ultimately, view was a product that provided a solution to the shading requirements and met with the hospital digital vision for looking at new technologies. View Glass embodies the primary principles of our design, lean, green, and digital. We can control it through a programmable system that follows the path of the sun as it crosses the sky, but a patient in the bed can also interrupt the programming to set it to a desired shading. Many of us from a clinical background, and we really wanted to focus on what would make our patient comfortable. The patient will have access to a number of things in their room. First of all, they have an integrated bedside terminal, which is a TV, gives them their email, it's the internet, it's their chart. It's one of those projects where you just feel, um, you know, you're giving something back. You're dealing with people, so getting natural light into a building, especially a hospital building, is wholly important. With the view glass, we still get the views. In that respect, it answered all our questions on so many levels. If you want to build the most energy efficient hospital in North America, it ain't going to be an easy road. And you have to stand up to a lot of the challenges that come to you. And we did it. So the technology and various types of similar technology have been around now for about uh, 10 years, and some even longer. Um, there, We have things like... Um, eyeglasses that tint when we go outside, uh, that's really a coating on the glass. The problem is you don't have really control over it. So I, I know numerous people who have such eyeglasses, they come back into their building and they say, you know, it's, I have to have a second pair of glasses in my office because they remain darker for a longer period of time. And then we have things like thermochromics, uh, which as an example, well actually I'll talk to you about that, and, or I'll get to uh, suspended particles, which we use often in things like um, interior partitions where we can take the glass from clear to translucent or clear to blackout. Um, difficult to control overall. And then of course there's a, something called thermochromics. And thermochromics actually are a three layers that are laminated in between the exterior. You have two pieces of glass on the exterior with a lamination in between them, a tan, a clear, and a blue. And the tan and blue are meant to uh, offset one another to give it, make it somewhat clear. The challenge with this technology is that it responds only after the sun has struck that building and then it heats up and over a period of time it heats up and it will uh, go dark. So you've, during that interim period you've experienced glare and unwanted solar heat gain. So they all have their place though. And, um, okay. and the, the idea here is that we're going to control the type of energy, the type of light, the level of light that can enter the building. So the first, sorry, this is uh, 
this is a new computer. So the, the, um, so the, the challenge that exists on buildings today is this, is are we comfortable inside the building? And, and of course, we, ha we have a number of guidelines that have been initiated, whether it be by ASHRAE or by the Ontario government, things like the um, SB10 guidelines, which are really meant to maximize the operating potential of the building, really in terms of uh, U-value, not allowing uh, uh, warm air to escape in the wintertime and controlling the uh, amount of HVAC load in the summertime. And that's typically through in the summertime or in, in some days uh, through solar heat gain rather than transference of thermal energy. So we love natural light, we love views, and we just can't always deal with it. So what do we do? We pull down blinds. And just for fun, on the next overcast day when you're driving around the city, take a look at 10 or 20 buildings. Even on a heavily overcast day, what you'll find is those blinds are down. People put them down and they often remain so for days on end. The challenge with that is we've lost natural light that could come into the building during that period of time. We've lost views to the exterior and really if it's sunlight were striking those closed blinds it becomes a radiative source of heat for the building actually contributing more to the cooling load. So and we've done all sorts of other things to do battle with this thing that we love the sun whether it be uh, mechanized integrated blinds, exterior shading devices, mechanized exterior shades, integrated, all these different things, often many, many times more expensive than the glass themselves. And often if they're electromechanical, they're also going to have some challenges in terms of longevity of life. So this has been what we've done forever. And typically if we're in a commercial building, this is what we're looking at, I'd say slide position three and four during the day. It often again gets closed and people don't open them. But what the newer technologies can do, and particularly this one that I love here, it actually changes properties as it's about to. So Tanner, I'm going to ask you to, this is an, on level one right now, I'm going to ask you to put it on level two. And what it's going to do, it's actually going to darken to a point where it's going to control visible light transmittance. And that's important because it's visible light transmittance that has a, a, the potential for solar heat gain. And so what we want to be able to do is we want to disallow solar heat gain in warm weather months and we want to allow desired solar heat gain in cold weather months. Well, we can do that today and we can do that and when we're able to do that, we're able to often considerably reduce the peak cooling load of the building as well. So this is typically what we're looking at here and uh, oddly enough, they didn't, in this project, they didn't uh, tint or use uh, the technology on the entrance doors, but they decided to after the building opened because they saw there was a huge glare issue. So I mentioned earlier on that the technology was intelligent. And what you're going to see in this next slide, you're going to see the sun in a position on the south side of the building, and it's traveling over to strike the west side of the building. Please note that the west side of the building prepares itself before the sun strikes it. That's what's absolutely critical. So you'll notice it. As well, notice that this side goes back to clear. If the sun's no longer striking it, we want maximum views. We want maximum amount of light energy into the building. So this is going to cause the building to be extremely, um, extremely uh, good in terms of performance, in terms of uh, operating expense, etc. One of the other challenges I often hear from architects are, you know, they designed this beautiful building, they turned it over to the owners, and drove by it a month later, and they say, I hardly even recognize that building. And often why that is, is there are now blinds inside the building where one is on the full upright uh, position, next one is fully down, next one is two-thirds up, half up, etc. And it really begins to look unattractive. So these technologies, and this technology will actually allow you to eliminate interior blinds. And if you can eliminate interior blinds, you get a beautiful look to the exterior facade of the building. There's no reason to have them whatsoever because you will not have unwanted solar heat gain. You will not have glare. And now we talk a lot about things like presenteeism. Yes, sir? It actually does three different things. It's a percentage of light is allowed. The question was, uh, is the heat absorbed by the glass or reflected back? A percentage of the light will enter the building. A percentage of the light will convert to heat energy on surface one and dissipate. And a percentage will bounce back, depending upon the level where it's at in terms of visible light transmittance. It will not. No, it does not. Absolutely does not. We're controlling it on the exterior elevation. That's important. Mm -hmm. So we talk about 
today about wellness in buildings, it's a, which is a new standard, um, which we're hearing about more and more. And I'm sure a number of people here can speak in a much more detailed fashion than I in that. But wellness is something we're talking about, how we feel inside a building. As an example, if we're allowing in natural light and controlling it so that we're comfortable, does it affect our circadian rhythm? And if we can affect our circadian rhythm positively, that's going to even affect things like digestion and how we feel, how we retain information, how we heal in healthcare, etc. So really important. And a number of people now have published huge studies in reference to this. And part of it is called presenteeism. So as an example, if people are in a building that they enjoy being in, let's say a commercial building or a school or something like that, they're literally going to show up more often. And we know that. And, and uh, so people like Vivian Loftus, the Carnegie Mellon University, she's done uh, a number of studies undertaking them. Uh, uh, Heshan Mahong, others as well, where they measured kids in classrooms where natural light was there and vision and how it really impacted their national test scores. Also, if you're doing a building where it's going to be comfortable to be in that building, it's, we, we know that we're going to get higher rental rates. I'm going to actually show you a last video when I've done this, where, where they're talking about a, 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 techno, a building actually in Colorado where they installed this and the, the, all of a sudden their rental rates uh, have increased dramatically both on a, uh, as a cost per use and the um, speed at which people wanted to inhabit the building. So we know that we'll have, as an example, premiums on rental rates, we'll have premiums on sale prices, and people will want to occupy that building because it's, it's certainly user friendly. And if we can do things like this, and if we can actually, uh, as an example, this technology contributes towards up to 28 lead credits. So they can be massively impactful there. And we know that if we're doing lead buildings, that that allows us some excellent return on investment as well. So the challenge today is this. Do we want a building that's going to be energy efficient? Well, of course we do. We all want to be energy efficient. But what if in that same building we could also have large vision areas and we could have natural light and we could have views at all times? I think that becomes a win-win-win situation. And that's what this dynamic technology allows us to achieve. And so things like the SB10 guidelines, I can tell you right now that uh, we are about to do a building in London that is 90% glass and we have no problem going beyond the SB10 guidelines. We're being considered in another one that is essentially 100% glass and we're going to have no problem with the technology doing that. So it's important to be able to do the research and, and um, uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. Now one of the ways we do that is we Uh, not a great relation, doesn't really affect our value unless you put uh, a low E coating on it, double or triple glaze. So as an example, um, we can triple glaze it, get a, a, a U value as low as 0 0.14. Well, SB10, the SB10 guidelines, as an example, will give you, uh, uh, will allow you, uh, as an example, a maximum of 40% window to wall ratio, right? <coughs> Right, in a prescriptive path. So what we can do with this technology is we can actually go the non-prescriptive route. We can show how uh, doing what we call an energy analysis on the building, how you can increase that quite dramatically, that window-to-wall ratio. And it's, it's uh, extremely detailed reports that we do. And actually, actually, if you'd like to see a copy of one, I can um, give you your card. I'll send it to you afterwards. And uh, frankly, I'm not in that area. We have uh, building scientists who do that and do it also as well with independent engineering architectural firms who run the data. But most happy to uh, send you a couple of samples of that. So the technology is this. On surface two, what you have is a coating. It's five atoms in thickness. And when, as an example, the glass has been told to tint, it's going to tint to a very specific amount. So typically we register or, or program the building at uh, 58, 40, 20, and 1% visible light transmittance. So what will happen is when it's been told to darken, a precise number of atoms will shift, or ions will shift one atom. And in doing so, we can absolutely control the level to which it's gone. So as an example, as you notice, this was clear earlier on, and Tanner has told it to go to level two. And when it wants to lighten, the ions shift the other way. This is exactly what a semiconductor does. It's really almost like a uh, five atom thick semiconductor that is non-electromechanical, so it's going to have a great deal of longevity. It's important when you're looking at new technologies to do testing. I actually should remove this because uh, this is the, the National Renewable Energy Lab. One of the standards, base standards is um, 
will it last? So in order to achieve that, you have to go through 50,000 cycles from clear to dark, back to clear, 50,000 times from beginning to end without stopping. If you do, you get this ASTM 2141-06 rating. So um, it's gone well beyond that. Numerous of the technologies have actually gone well beyond that. So this is Humber River Hospital. There's several things going on here which are really important. So the building, as I mentioned earlier on, it's going to, uh, it knows the day of year, the time of day, the watts of energy striking every elevation, and then it's going to change properties in advance. But if I'm a patient in there and I want to have a nap, I can simply touch a screen beside my bed. My glass will go to not, not blackout, but almost blackout to 1% or slightly below 1% visible light transmittance and for a predetermined period of time. Or even from the nursing station, they can do the same thing. They can control it. Let's say if I was uh, post-operative and they think, say this guy should sleep for an hour or two in the morning and the afternoon, they can actually control it from the nursing station. And it's assumed that when they darken it down, I will um, go to sleep for a period of time. So another one of the installations that's really interesting is down in Beamsville. It's the Redstone Winery. And the challenge here is it's a beautiful winery, really high-end wines. They hired a, a renowned chef to come in there it's floor to ceiling glass, I would say about, uh, um, about five meters, five and a half meters in height. Uh, they want you to be in there, they want you to do, do wine testing, they want you to enjoy the view which is looking over the vineyard and Lake Ontario, and they want you to be comfortable. So in even a facility like this, no problems whatsoever, people are not experiencing glare, they're not experiencing um, unwanted solar heat gain. The point is, with these technologies now, you can have a building that is awash with natural light and people inside will be comfortable at all times. And we know when you're doing that, you're going to be uh, more productive. As I mentioned earlier on, you're going to heal faster. And it's important to be able to have control over it as well. So if you have control, you can override it as you need to on a case-by-case -case basis, um, right down to actually individual IG units. You're looking at an installation here. On the right is a regular low E glass, low iron glass, I should say. On the left is, is this technology here. So it's actually become very clear now in the latest generation in terms of what it can do. So um, we talked about, I mentioned earlier on that the technology uh, controls itself, yet you can override it. And you can override it as you wish to. You can have an app from a smartphone. You can have a wall switch. You can have an app, uh, an app on your iPad as well. One of the other advantages here is how do we install this? So at Humber River, one of the reasons why they decided to use this technology was the ease of installation. So if as an example, we had a, a wall here with 100 windows in it and we were using mechanized blinds, we typically run a home run from every one of those windows or at least every second one of those windows to a junction box somewhere as a series of junction box. Very expensive to do in terms of labor um, and uh, subject to human error as well. So what we've done is we've eliminated that. What we would do at Humber as an example, we had a control package per floor, a home run, and then a T to a window controller for every IG unit. It meant that it was extremely simple to install. Um, PCL uh, did actually some analysis and talked about how much uh, cost savings they had as a result of using this technology in terms of installation. And so when you have this, you have huge flexibility as well. Uh, so the building itself is going to have a sensor on it, on the roof. It's going to have actually 13 sensors on a pole. It's, um, it, you can operate this independent of the BAS and talk to the BAS, or you can have it controlled by the BAS in concert with your lighting and with your HVAC system. And of course, it's important to track the sun to know where it is, and you can configure it virtually any way you want to configure it. And the point is, it's a plug-and-play system. Extremely simple, sophisticated, yet extremely simple technology. And it's important that you have intelligence, because it's going to do this and operate in advance of needing to do so. So if you're thinking, well, this stuff has to be really complicated to deal with, it's not. There are a couple of architects here whom I've worked with on projects, and um, the idea here is that we've made it sophisticated, yet we've made it extremely simple at the same time. So one of the things is, in terms of channel of integration, it's just like any other glass. We work with um, most uh, glazing contractors. We try to avoid the guy with the uh, pickup truck and ladder, but uh, other than that, we're, we're, we're really wor working with uh, just about all of them. Now, in terms of in integrating into the design process, this is important. And one of the things that I mentioned earlier on that we'll do 
here, and it's important to understand this in a non-prescriptive route, is to look at how this can affect the building. How's it going to perfect performance on the building? Can we reduce the peak cooling load? Can we eliminate exterior sh uh, shading devices? Can we um, eliminate interior blinds, etc.? And we'll do that. Uh, actually, we have building scientists on, on staff, but they actually work with independent architectural engineer engineering firms so that the data becomes entirely neutral. And so we like to get involved right at the beginning of a project, but we can be involved later on. And so what we'll do is we'll do this, and then we'll uh, be there all the way through, and we commission the building, and then we monitor the glass for a period of time in case it needs tweaking. Because let's say somebody has it in their boardroom on the south side of the building, and they say, hey, we're finding it a little too bright or a little too dark. Uh, we can actually reprogram the glass right from Silicon Valley. No one has to come to do the building to do it. So um, this is the technology and explosive view. I don't, I don't, I have a number of case studies now which are on real buildings. Uh, so this is what we used to talk about, how we'd be looking for um, um, peak cooling load reductions as well as reducing. So we're going to switch gears here a little bit and um, show you some other technologies in terms of, and just give you some ideas of what can be done in buildings. So we're doing quite a bit of work right now with the Canadian military in the high Arctic. And we've done some pretty interesting projects in terms of getting a high R value or very low U value in, in glass. This is a project that we did in Antarctica for the British UN Research Centre. And th this glass is a value of R46. Uh, very, very expensive to do, but we're regularly today doing R28 glass for the Canadian military in the high Arctic. No problem to achieve that. So we talked in the past as well, I've been talking for years about light and what the effects are on people and what we can do with it. So one of the things we want to do is rather than fighting light, why don't we take this light and truly harvest it. And we have the ability to do that. This is an old photo, but it really exemplifies the challenge here, which is high uh, contrasting in light. And when we experience a high contrast in light, we experience glare. So as an example, let's say you're out watching, you're at the Sky Dome and watching the uh, or Roger Center watching uh, Blue Jays play. It's in the afternoon. Uh, you, and they have the banner, the banks of lights on, you probably note that you can look directly at those banks of lights and you're not feeling uncomfortable. Why that is is because if it's a bright sunny day, our eyes will have dialed down considerably and so we can, we can deal with that. We can walk outside on the brightest day without sunglasses, we'll adjust to that. We can walk in, on, in the darkest evening, uh, perhaps a moonlit evening, and our eyes adjust to that easily. We just can't do both at the same time. And that's when we experience glare. And this is a typical example of it. So we have there are other technologies in use that can allow us to do that. So we can use different types of dynamic glass, or we can actually take this glass and we can bring it into a building and control what it's going to do inside the building. This is Ridley College. They actually didn't end up doing it quite this way, but they wanted to bring in natural light into the arena. And this is called a radiance simulation. And if you know what radiance is or don't know what it is, it actually is a software program that takes a building's location, the north vector again, and it anticipates every photon of light that's going to enter that building. So here, what are we dealing with here is an overlit area. And because our eyes will have then been dialed down, it'll appear to be very dark areas. But what we can do with this light is we can actually diffuse it into the building as well. And Tanner has uh, there are numerous types of technology that do that. Do that. And on the bottom, what we've done is we've taken the, I think the, the top of the visible light transmittance factor was 68. On the bottom, it's 34. But we're perfectly diffusing the light into the building. And we'll, that's another thing that we'll do. We'll actually show you how that light can be engineered into the building. This is for a general contractor who do uh, design build projects. It's clear glass on the top. On the bottom, we've halved the visible light transmitters, but we're diffusing the light inside the building. This is Ross Gym. It's clear glass on the top. It's diffusing glass on the bottom. It's 10 o'clock in the morning. First thing I'm going to do if I'm a custodian walking in there is I'm going to turn on artificial lights. We know artificial lights do, uh, obviously, they, they contribute towards the light levels, but they also create extra heat for the building as well. Here it is two hours later and two hours later. So typically what we'll be doing is design a building, but th then we're having to turn on artificial lights. We really don't need to do that if we really take a look at the building holistically and say, let's use glass that's really going to cause this building to perform at a higher level. This is the University of Michigan indoor football practice facility. I've met actually three people who uh, played there and they practiced in this building. On top is a what I call a, an intermediate uh, light diffuser. It's a white PVB interlayer. On bottom is a technology that Tanner's going to 
show you here, which is specifically designed to control light. Now, here's note on the top, they need artificial lights on, even during the daytime. This is what's happening. This is light on the top coming into the building and converting to heat energy. So not only do they need artificial lights on, they need a massive HVAC system to cool it, whereas on the bottom, we don't. And so you can end up with a building awash with natural light, no lights on during the day. We've done this in schools, right down to individual classrooms. It's, you're certainly able to do that. So for years, we thought, well, acid edge glass diffuses light. This is a polar chart. It's actually showing you uh, how acid edge glass is diffused. It, does, it diffuses the tiniest bit. So the angle of incidence is at 45 degrees. If it were clear glass, clear low E glass as an example, it would, that, that uh, light would come and strike at exactly the minus 45 point. If it's acid etched glass, what acid etched glass does, it actually shifts the light as it's entering. And you can see that, that it shifted a few degrees off the 45 point. This is a PVB interlayer. It's a moderate diffuser of light, but note it doesn't lift it. And that's what's really critical, to be able to lift that light into the building and cause that building to become awash with natural light. So here's what uh, other technologies can do. We can bring that light in. It's, and this zero plane represents both the floor and the ceiling. So that light diffuses everywhere inside the building. And then because we're controlling the infrared part of the spectrum, it's going to bounce multiple times inside the building so to cause that building to become a wash with natural light. The point is, you actually are not fighting it, you're harvesting daylight when you're using technologies like this. And even buildings that we've done were uh, built like icebergs where the majority of the building is underground, we've been able to achieve that with those as well. This is a project uh, in Stouffville. It's the Stouffville Community Center. It's been open a couple of years. It was a Perkins and Will project. And what they wanted to do bring, was bring natural light in through the arena, into the arena area by those slats. Now, if we just allowed that light to come in without controlling it, what you'd have were areas on the ice which would be overlit, melting the ice, causing glare. Uh, but what, but we, we, excuse me, my mouth is dry. But because we're able to um, purposely diffuse that light, we end up with a building that's awash with natural light. No, nowhere near the glare that you would have with artificial lights. Think in terms of indoor pools. It's really a challenge here when, uh, if we want to bring in natural light and have, have vision to the exterior, that's actually dangerous. You could have a couple of lifeguards around there. You wouldn't see someone who could be in trouble at the bottom of the pool. But if we diffuse it, as we did here at the Sydney Olympic facility, and you, this is what you're looking at. This is clear glass. You can see the result of it. If we're able to diffuse it, we're able to have a building that's awash with natural light. It's going to be a high performing, performing building. And of course, we need to look at those in a non-prescriptive route and how it is going to perform, it's going to impact every component of the building. So you can do that. It doesn't matter where the sun is in its azimuth travel. Whether And this is showing you an azimuth chart of a particular location in Dublin. Uh, the sun, wherever it is, is going to virtually perfectly diffuse that light into the building. Because what we're looking at doing is how we control, with this technology, where the sun is, it, just coming over the horizon, has a fairly high solar heat gain, fairly high light transmission, or when the sun's really high in the sky, how we can control that as well. This is another thing, uh, technology we've used for years, uh, uh, putting blinds, integrated blinds or stationary uh, louvers inside glass. The idea is that uh, with the stationary ones, the sun's going to come down, it's going to bring that light deeply into the building, uh, wash the ceiling with natural light, and we've done a number of buildings um, all over the world, frankly, with them. Um, with the, now, then there are other techniques where we take various specific types of interlayers. So we, we, I know there's one called heat mirror, as an example, which is designed to control the heat entering the building. And we do it with a number of different ways with these interlayers that are really designed to control how much energy can enter the building by the generally midday here by the month of the year. So we want to control that, i.e. warm weather months control how much energy can we uh, can enter the building. So one of the things that Tanner's going to hold up, it's a, it's a aluminum looking, and that's what's actually filling this uh, curtain wall area here. It's a, it, which one is it, Tanner? It's copper. Oh, the aluminum version of that, of an expanded metal mesh. And, and to your point, that mesh is actually three-dimensionally shaped, like much like an eyelid. So when the sun's lower in the sky, more energy will come in. Sun's higher in the sky, less energy when, will come in. Uh, Rem Coolhouse did the uh, Seattle Public Library, which is covered majorly in the same technology, and it's really designed. He wanted to eliminate uh, uh, glare, he wanted to eliminate un unwanted solar heat gain, and he wanted to allow views to the exterior. And as you can see, he certainly achieved it. I've met many architects who have been here, there, and told me that even on the brightest sunny days, 
there is no glare. You'll see 100 people sitting there with their laptops. Uh, WZ Animation used the same technology for the Quinty uh, Courthouse as well. It's an absolutely gorgeous building. Uh, this is one that uh, David Chipperfield did. It's in Des Moines. It's a three-dimensional mesh inside designed to control light. And actually, he calls this living glass because look at how it changes its look throughout the day. And then you can put all sorts of other decorative interlayers that are designed to control light, designed to control uh, solar heat gain uh, as well. Even wood. So we've done some interesting ones at uh, Brooklyn Library's example, where we took kiln-dried wood, kiln-dried for 30 days. It'll never dry, rot, crack, split, or fade. Um, we also did it a spandrel panel there. can be used on the interior or on the exterior as well. We did a project in Sydney where we actually were able to, to curve it. Uh, on a, a mid-sized building. So one of the areas we talk about often in terms of glass is spandrel panels. What can we do with that? So um, we've developed, uh, actually Tanner, you're going to talk about this because you know more about this than I do. Okay. So we've developed a spandrel panel where we trap a vacuum insulated panel inside of the IG. And how it works is, well here's a on the left is U-values of other insulating materials. And with a one-inch unit, we can achieve an R-value of R25. With an inch and a half, it's R33. With a two-inch unit, it's R30, R50. So now you can have massive spandrel panels at any of these, uh, at any of the other Ocalux offerings. So if you're doing Ocatec on a building, you can incorporate the Ocatec interlayer into the spandrel or you can do a digital print ceramic frit of any pattern or design which you like. And you can also do them in sizes up to two by four meters in size, so fairly large. And we're also doing very large oversized glass. Currently, it's about six by 2.3 meters. Here's John next to a six by 2.3 meter IGU. And Here's some other installs which we've done with that glass. This is the HBC Hillcrest Mall, just north of the city. It was uh, installed as of October this year. And here's what it currently looks like. We did the Queen Richmond Center, which is a 70-foot structural glass wall with a, a roller wave distortion of only 0 0.04 millimeters. The glass is virtually flat. It's of uh, 10 on 12 on 10 millimeter laminate with a uh, SGP interlay. And just a few other projects which we've done.